Hey, well, good morning. Welcome to Real Life Church Online. My name is Raul. I'm Stacy. We're so thrilled to have you joining us today. It is a great day to wrap up our series on You Know What I Like About Jesus. Yeah, it's been a great question. We've been asking that question every single Sunday morning and hearing more about what God is calling us into together. So we're going to go into a time of worship yep. together. So if you're hearing our voice from the living room on your phone or laptop, grab your coffee, grab your water, and we will see you back here after worship. Hey everyone, welcome. If you're tuning in right now or checking out this video, whatever, and getting ready to worship, we're worshiping here with you. Excited that we get to do this with you, even you're you're at home maybe or at work, wherever you're at. I hope it blesses you. Here we go. When darkness tries to roll over my bones. Sorrow comes to steal the joy I've known. And brokenness and pain is all I know. Oh, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your life. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your life. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Yeah. Your shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. Oh, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance.
treasures of our garden keep Lift up your voice and with us sing Oh, amazing There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire. Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. Yeah. 
There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come on, may in the space between all the things unseen and his reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Father God in heaven, God, I pray that everyone who's listening and worshiping today, God, that we would just claim the power, the love that you have given us. Give us courage, Father, to walk this week as a people that you've called us to be. Thank you, Father, for standing in the fire with us for taking every single step with us. We give it all to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, well, welcome back. Thank you so much to our worship team. It's been really incredible getting to be the church online. Even through the whole entire week we've had, Absolutely. we can still gather, have worship online together. Uh, and we get to be the church. And there's life happening at the church, whether you're watching online with us or you get to visit us in person. We would love to say hello uh, and see your face and smile and 
maybe give you a high five and wave a hand. Um, but we have things happening at Real Life, and Stacy knows all the information because <laughs> I'm going to mess up the date. It's great. We are so excited about Sunday, August 29th. We are going to be gathering at the Glendora campus. I think we're going to put the address somewhere for you. And we are going to still have church at Valley Center. We'll still have our online service that day. But that night from 6 to 8 p.m., we have an incredible party planned. We're going to have two different bands. We're going to have a message from Pastor Jim about where we're going as a church, where God is leading and calling us. We're going to have fun things for the kids, lots of food. I was going to say, that's, <laughs> that's my favorite part is the free food. If you if you have an event, you're like, uh, you know, getting back into the world, I have friends are asking me about my church. This is the event to invite your friends, especially those with kids, because we have uh, inflatables are coming. We and do. There's going to be rides for the kids. It's going to be a great time. But yes, free food. And if you are wondering what kind of food, super yummy food, but also food in the realm of a chili cook-off. I was trying to figure out a way to like, deliver uh, it. Ah. So if you are a chili cooker, go to reallife.la slash chili to let us know. I'd love to cook chili for a bunch of people. We're going to buy all the cups and spoons for the tasting. We're going to have a fun little contest. We can hardly wait. And if you are wondering how do I find out more information, you can go to reallife.la and we have the events calendar for you. We have an invitable link for you to share with people because this is definitely something. Whether you have been with us for a long time, you're new, you're ready to be out and inviting people to this is the event you want to invite yeah so we'd love to see you there like again invite your friends invite your families it's gonna be a good time but we're gonna finish uh our series today we are and we before we get to our sermon part of today our teaching part we're gonna open the word together we just wanted to say thank you church for how you've leaned in you've invited people in you've delivered groceries and medicine you've prayed with and for people but not only that you have given so sacrificially in this season there were those of you that lost jobs you had an uncertain future some of you got sick and you have been prayed for but not only that you have given in such extraordinary ways there has been incredible life change we've seen kids and students and adults make decisions to follow Jesus to say enough with the loud world things that are happening I'm going to put my trust in God and you have made that possible if you want to get involved in partnering with giving at the church you can go to reallife.la slash give send us an email anytime info at reallife.la let's go ahead and go to Pastor Jim and wrap up our series Hey, Real Life Church, it's Pastor Jim. It's good to be with you again. Today we are rounding out our series, Know What I Like About Jesus. We spent the whole summer focusing on the life of Jesus, looking at the teachings of Jesus, and I appreciate you indulging me and letting me just kind of talk about things uh, that I like about him. Uh, for me, it's been a great summer. I've loved uh, focusing in on him. And actually, I, I had this uh, recollection of something that happened to me when I was in college uh, that later on made a lot more sense to me. I remember, I think it was probably the first time I ever saw somebody healed in prayer. And uh, I don't know why I'd forgotten this one. It was kind of buried in my mind somewhere, but it, something triggered it last week. Uh, I, when I was a senior in college, I lived in an apartment with a bunch of other guys from my church. And uh, one of my friends, Kevin, uh, had gone out uh, early in the day to play football in the street. Because when you're a student at Berkeley, you learn how to do wise and safe things, like play football in the street. And so he's out playing football in the street, and as he's running to catch a pass, he twists his ankle, and he, he just cries out in it, this pain that shoots through his leg. And he's in such bad pain, he can't walk on his foot anymore, uh, and uh, uh, doesn't know what to do. So a friend actually helps him limp over to the, the little nurse's station that's on the campus. He physically couldn't get there himself. Well, they told him, take a couple of Advil and call us tomorrow. And, uh, and so he, he gets back home again, and he's just in, in extreme pain and, uh, and doesn't know what to do about it. So we took a moment, and we prayed together uh, that his foot would be healed, and nothing happened. 
But then he went off on his own and took his Bible, and he spent a few minutes just reading the Bible, uh, and then started praying. And he said, I wasn't necessarily praying that my foot would be healed, I just started praying. And as I did, I felt this warm sensation rushing into my ankle, and all the pain went away. And, and I saw him after that, and he went from just excruciating pain to suddenly being able to walk around on his foot again. And, of course, at the time, it didn't occur to me, hey, maybe this kind of thing happens, just like it did all, through all of Jesus' ministry and through all the ministry of the disciples. It, you know, we just were kind of amazed by it, and then we went on with life. But, but what occurs to me now as I look back on that story is it wasn't in the, the prayer for healing that he was healed. It was in stopping to spend time focused on Jesus. It was in stopping to take time and dwell in the presence of Jesus that suddenly he was healed. And, and it occurs to me now, having, having read lots of books on prayer and healing and having had much more life experience than I did back then as a senior in college, there's something that comes with standing in the presence of Jesus that's, that's supernatural. Uh, uh, many of the best gifts that Jesus wants to give us come not because we go chasing after them, but because we stop and spend time dwelling in the presence of Jesus. And so I've loved this summer and being able to, to spend this summer just fixated on Jesus and thinking about Jesus and meditating on Jesus. And really the goal of the Christian life is that we would find our way into his presence and never leave it. That every day would be filled with a focus on him. That everything we do would be dedicated to him. That we wouldn't let our minds wander far from him. And so I've, I've enjoyed this, this summer with Jesus and with you. So today I want to round out that series, and I want to look at uh, another aspect of the Christian life. And this one actually occurred to me uh, when I was, uh, I was sitting in a cafe working on a sermon a couple weeks ago. And, uh, and I do this thing sometimes where I'm sitting in a cafe. I like to try to engage people in meaningful conversations, and I try to point the conversations towards Jesus at some point. And so sometimes when I'm sitting in cafes, I'll start chit-chatting with whoever's near me just to see where the conversation goes. And so there was a, a young guy sitting near me, and uh, I, I turned to him, and I said, uh, hey, can you help me out? Uh, I'm working on a sermon because I'm a pastor, and I have a question to ask, and it'll help me write my sermon. Can I write can I ask you this question? And he said, yeah. And I said, what is it that people find most bothersome about Christians? And now I, I tend to ask questions like that to younger adults rather than older adults. And I'll tell you why. When I ask older people questions like that, they're really reticent to answer. They very rarely launch into an answer to questions like that. And I think that might be because as we live our lives... As we go through our lives, we, we start to know ourselves better, and I think that, that often comes with some humility. When we start to realize we don't have all the answers and we haven't lived life perfectly, we start to be a little bit more humble about the criticisms that we jump into of other people. Uh, so when I ask older people questions like that, they, they, often kind of, they often kind of shrug off the question. Unless I ask them what they don't like about younger people. And then I always get an answer to that. You whippersnappers, you always just want to have your cake and eat it too. In my day. Um, but, but, uh, but not this one. So I asked a young guy. He's probably in his 20s. And I said, hey, what is it that people generally don't like about Christians? And he jumped to an answer. He goes, you guys are legalistic. He says, everything is holier than thou. And I realized there was some emotion in his voice. And I said, oh, oh yeah, you know, I hear that a lot. I think that's exactly right. You know, I'm trying to be agreeable because I realized by the look on his face, this isn't just going to be an objective, rational conversation. And he goes, and another thing, you guys are hypocrites. You hold people to one standard and then you don't meet it yourselves. And I said, oh, and now I'm kind of in my periphery. I'm looking for an escape route. I'm completely sorry I started this conversation at this point because he's really, he's into this conversation now. And so he kind of goes on for a little while about how bad Christians are. And I'm just trying to nod and pretend like you know, I, I'm totally on his side. And so, so to sort of round it out, I say to him, now let me, let me make sure I get this straight because you know, I'm writing a sermon. I want to make sure I get this straight. You're saying Christians hold people to a high standard that they themselves don't meet. And he goes, exactly. And I said, and, and you think Christians themselves should meet that higher standard? And he says, right. And I said, now for that high standard that you think Christians should meet, do you think most non-Christian people, people who don't believe, meet that standard themselves. Like you, for instance. Do you, do you meet the standard that you would hold Christians to in terms of 
sticking to what they say, not being holier than thou. And he goes, well, no, I'm not a Christian, so I don't have to meet their standards. I said, okay, okay, perfect, that makes sense. Let me make sure I got this right. Christians hold people to a higher standard that they themselves don't meet. And you think Christians should meet a higher standard that you yourself don't meet. And he said, well, well, yeah. And I said, why is it okay for you to do that to Christians, but it's not okay for Christians to do that to you? And he goes, it just is. <laughs> I thought, that's exactly right. It just, it just is. <laughs> but, but he had caught on to something actually really spiritually important in our culture and in the lives of, of Christians. Because Christians have this ambiguous relationship about the law, about God's law, about the rules. Because we go around saying, you can't be saved by your good works. Don't try to earn God's favor by doing good things. You just have to believe. It's all about believing. You just have to believe. But then we say, but you should still be good. Well, you wait, which is it? Are we supposed to meet these high standards or are the high standards irrelevant? Well, in, in the Bible, there's a, a theme that runs throughout it uh, known as holiness. Holiness is that, that act of being set apart from the world for special purposes. Right? That act of being set apart from brokenness and from the pers pursuit of selfish things to pursue the things of God. The, the holiness theme runs throughout the entire Bible, but it it sometimes leave, leaves us with this ambiguous sense of, wait, which is it? Jesus got in arguments with legalists all the time. And yet, Christians are supposed to meet some kind of higher standard. What are we supposed to do with that? Well, perhaps holiness exists not to make me look good and not to make other people feel bad but to set God free within me. You know what I like about Jesus is he made me good and he made me for good. And that's what I want to look at today. If you've got a Bible with you, open to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 5 and we're going to look at uh, the writings of the Apostle Paul. Paul, you may know, is a first century preacher. And he went around the Mediterranean planting churches everywhere he went. He'd go into a town that maybe he had never been to before and he would find the Jewish population and say, the Messiah that we've been waiting for has come. He's finally here. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. And then after beginning to build a Christian community within the, the Jewish population, he would reach out to non-Jewish people, to Gentiles, and say, the God that you long for has walked on the earth. Let me tell you who he is. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Paul went to Galatia and he said, the good news is we've been freed from the law of God. Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins. And now all we have to do is believe in him. We're free. And then Paul went on to another town to start another church. And after that, some preachers from Jerusalem landed in Galatia. And they came with sort of a new twist on the message. Remember I told you Jerusalem was sort of the pedigree town. Jerusalem was like the, the Harvard of its day. If somebody came from Jerusalem, they were an authority. And the preachers from Jerusalem said... It's fine for you to think that you're free in Christ, but you still have to follow all the Jewish laws. You still have to follow all the ceremonial laws. You have to keep the holidays. You have to keep the rituals. You have to follow all the rules. And the Galatians write a letter to Paul and say, which is it? And Paul writes back a very angry letter in which he, in which he takes a very clear stand on how we are to relate to the law, on what Christian holiness is supposed to look like. And so we're going to read together from Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 13. Paul begins, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Jesus died to make us free. That runs throughout the entire Bible. In the Hebrew Scriptures, God is the God who set you free from slavery in Egypt. That's who God is. God is someone who wants his people to be free. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Paul will write. So don't return to the law and enslave yourself again. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Isn't it ironic that the average cafe-dwelling pagan, I mean that in a good way, the average cafe-dwelling pagan thinks that Christians are all legalists, when in fact, Christians are people who theologically, doctrinally believe we are the ones who have been set free from the law. 
How ironic is it that we get a reputation for being legalists when the law is exactly what Jesus died for? You've been set free from the law the way a child is set free from a nursemaid that takes care of it until the child is an adult. Don't go back to the nursemaid. You're a grown-up now. Paul says Christianity ought to be defined by what we are free to, not not what we're obligated to. You, You ask around in modern American society, and Christians are primarily known for what we're against. You Christians, you're against the LGBTQ community. You're against science. You're against being polite to people when you're in disagreements. You're against all kinds of things. That's what, that's what Christians are about. Christians ought to be defined by our freedom. You are free from a guilty conscience. Jesus has redeemed you and your past has walked away. You should walk in peace and in confidence every day. You are free for that. You are free to love lost people in Jesus' name. It was in Jesus' day that the the religious legalists said, don't talk to all those unclean people. Don't talk to Samaritans. Don't talk to tax collectors. Don't talk to prostitutes. Don't talk to adulterers. They're going to corrupt our community. They're bad influences on our kids. Stay away from them. And Jesus says, okay, while you guys stay over here and have that little party, I'm going to go hang out with all the people you don't like. We're free to love people in his name without fear. We're free to step across the boundaries that our world has created. The the Jewish people in the book of Nehemiah say, let's not intermarry with any of the surrounding cultures because they worship foreign gods. We don't want to do that, so let's only intermarry within our own culture. And it's not until the New Testament, when the disciples go and begin to share the gospel with non-Jewish people, that the The gospel opens up to the world. You are free to love people in Jesus' names. You shouldn't be known as legalists. That's not what Christianity is about. So Paul says, don't forget, brothers and sisters, you have been set free. So what do we do with the call to holiness? If Christians are called to live by a different standard... How does that fit in with the fact that we are free from standards? Paul's going to give us two motivations for holiness in Galatians chapter 5. He says, now, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. And by that, he means all the kind of the selfish desires we have, the impulses that we have that we know might not be good for us, but we want to do anyway. Don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Paul's getting that from Jesus who got that from the book of Leviticus, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. So holiness, first and foremost, exists for other people. It exists to set you free to love. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. If your holiness makes you proud of yourself, it's just going to destroy your community. Holiness isn't there to make us feel good about ourselves or to make other people feel bad about themselves. It's there to set us free to love. And that actually makes good sense. When you think about living a holy life as an act of love, it makes good sense. It's like this. Imagine uh, you go to give a, uh, a cup of cold water to somebody, right? They're thirsty and you go to offer them a cup of cold water. But in the process, you you put your finger in the glass and your finger's a little bit dirty, right? And so when you go to offer them a gift, it's like, here, here, I got you a nice glass of cold water. I'm not not sure how good a gift that's going to be. I'm not sure who's going to want to look at your muddy water gift and say, oh, thanks, that's exactly what, I'd I'd rather be thirsty. Thanks, I'm, I'm good, right? Well, holiness works exactly this way. It's there to set us free to love. It's there to uh, allow us, to call us, to clean the dirt out of our lives so that we, we're better able to love the people around us. Imagine God making you a better person so that you can be better at loving other people. Imagine God making you a better spouse or parent or friend or coworker, And by making you better, you are more free to love. Holiness, first and foremost, exists not for the sake of making us feel good about ourselves, but for others, setting us free to love other people. 
So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that, and the NIV says, so that you are not to do whatever you want, but the actual, the Greek translation is, so that you end up not doing what you want. You, you've got this battle going on inside of you, so you want to do good things, but you end up doing the things that you didn't want to do. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. And so, Paul's he, Paul here, this is, the, this is the heart of the answer to the question to my cafe friend. This, this is where Christian holiness falls. It's not by obedience to the law that, be, that we become holy. It's by following the Spirit that God has placed within us. It's by living in step with the Spirit. By walking in the Spirit. And, and Paul here is trying to avoid two errors. He doesn't want us on the one hand becoming legalists. Living by obedience to the law will fail you. Uh, if you've been watching here at Real Life for a while, or if you've been attending here at Real Life, uh, you know that a few weeks ago I stood up here with a big scale, and I talked about how some of us think that our good works and our bad works are going to be weighed against each other, and we hope the good works outweigh the bad a little bit in the end. And I said, that's not Christianity. That's not the message of Christianity. That is legalism. And Paul doesn't want us falling back into the legalism of thinking, well, if I'm a good enough person, God will approve of me. Jesus died on the cross so we didn't have to answer to that system anymore. So on the one hand, Paul doesn't want us to be legalists. But on the other hand, Paul does not want us to be apathetic to holy lives, to holy living. Paul doesn't want us to stop caring about living good lives, the kind of lives that God designed for us. Uh, I was reading, uh, one of my favorite poets is uh, uh, W.H. Auden. Uh, Auden was a Christian poet who lived uh, in the 20th century. And uh, he wrote this uh, very long poem about uh, Christmas in the American suburbs. And what Auden did was he had this, this beautiful, powerful sense of the deep spirituality of common life. And he would, he would pull out what was going on spiritually under the surface in things that just look normal to us. And so he was looking at the Christmas season. When we pull out all the decorations, we celebrate the birth of Christ, we talk about how much God has loved the world and saved the world, and then we put it all back in the box and we're done with it. And he has this one, this one snapshot of, of Christmas in the suburbs. Uh, and I think this is beautiful because we've all experienced this. And it's the snapshot of becoming apathetic to the life that God has called us to. He writes, As in previous years, we have seen the actual vision. Right? We've seen this, this promise of God who's come to the earth. We've seen the actual vision and failed to do more than entertain it as an agreeable possibility. Right? What, a, what a great way to summarize how we, how we approach, it, approach Christmas. Jesus is born. God has walked the earth. Seems like a good idea. You know, let's we'll pull out the decorations again. Right? We entertain it as an agreeable possibility. And once again, we have sent him away. We've put the manger scene back in the box. We have sent him away, begging, though, to remain his disobedient servant. And I thought that's such a great, that's such a great summary of how so many of us approach spirituality. Please, God, I want to follow you, but not that much. You know, I mean, like, I really, I just don't want to be too serious about it. Like those crazy religious people, I don't, I, let's just be friends. Uh, St. Augustine in the early church, Augustine of Hippo once said, God make me holy, but not yet. And that, that's, that's the prayer so many of us offer. We're begging to be his disobedient servant. I want to be your servant, but not too much. The promising child who cannot keep his word for long. And that's what Paul wants to steer us against. Don't become the, the promising child who doesn't keep his word for long. Don't, don't, don't go back to the law and become a servant of the law and become puffed up about yourself and look down on others. That's legalism and it's destructive. But don't stop caring about the life that God means for you. Don't turn off the drive to live right. In your freedom, don't indulge the sinful nature. Paul will go on. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And here, flesh is not a reference to the physical body. He's not saying the physical body is bad. He's saying the, the impulsive desires uh, that, that tend to take over uh, our, our conscious will. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, 
fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And when Paul says inherit the kingdom of God, your mind might immediately go to a picture of heaven. He means I'm not going to get into heaven. Paul's picture of, of the kingdom of God is bigger than that. The, the kingdom of God is the promise that in this world, God's will starts to break in in our lives as we follow after Jesus. And if you live a destructive life, you're never going to experience the full and abundant life that Jesus wants for you. If you go chasing after all the desires that come to us and, and plague us, the, the desires that we have trouble shaking off, if you live for those, if you live with the addictions to the pleasures of this world, you're never going to be able to live the abundant life that Jesus wants for you. And again, this is just good sense. Have you known anybody who is so addicted to substances that they were no longer free? That person, that person isn't being free by pursuing whatever they want. They're binding themselves by pursuing whatever they want. That's why Paul says, don't use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. It doesn't set you free. It ties you down. Have you, have you ever known somebody who is addicted to, to sex or to money or to laziness? We can get stuck in patterns of behavior that do not set us free, thinking that by following them, we're expressing our true freedom. Paul wants us free to live the life that God designed for us. And holiness is that pathway to that life. Now, Paul's going to give us a pretty uh, strong contrast here between the, the life of the flesh and the life of the spirit. Uh, and when he does this, it reminds me of a metaphor I read uh, in one of the Catholic mystics of the Middle Ages, John of the Cross. And John of the Cross says that the Christian life ultimately should be like a window. A window doesn't have to run around busying itself, doing different things to make God happy. A window just sits in the place where it is placed. It's, it sits where it was made to be. And if the window is clean, the light just shines through it. And John says, this is how the Christian life is. If you, if you are in the place where God has put you, and you live a holy life, God will just shine through you. And it's not there to make us feel good about ourselves. And it's not there to make other people feel bad about themselves. When the window is doing its job, the window disappears. And all you pay attention to is the light. When we live holy lives, God shines through us. And if you've ever had that experience of knowing that Jesus is using you in this world to love other people, you know there isn't a better experience than that. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Concerning such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Right? If we are legalists, we're going to get puffed up by it. We are to crucify the flesh and its desires and keep in step with the Spirit. We are to say no to the one and say yes to the other. I, I remember seeing a, an image of somebody being turned towards holiness, turns towards, turned towards Jesus because of holiness. Uh, and it's in, a, it's in a very famous novel that's actually a Christian novel. That One of the best novelists of all history is a guy named Fyodor Dostoevsky. And one of his best novels is called Crime and Punishment. And it's actually a Christian novel. In the novel, a kind of a selfish and brooding man named Raskolnikov goes around thinking that life is meaningless and there is no God. And since he's fairly poor, he decides that he's going to go and murder a woman who's a pawnbroker and has a lot of money, but she's a nasty woman. And he's decided she doesn't deserve to live and he's going to kill her and take her money away. Meanwhile, there's a Christian woman in his life named Sonia. And Sonia reaches out to him with the story of Jesus and tries to impress upon him how different his life would be if he followed Jesus. And he thinks about it. He entertains it as a distant possibility. But he doesn't make that turn. 
And so then he goes to carry out the murder and he does it with an axe. Eventually he confesses to Sonia to what he's done and she tells him to go and turn himself in. Now, I'm sorry for all the spoilers, but the novel was published in 1866. You've had time. Anyway, he goes to turn himself in. And he's, he's Russian, so he's sent to a camp in Siberia. And he's in a prison in Siberia, and Sonia follows him there to slip food through the bars so he doesn't starve to death in prison. And he looks at the life that she's living, this life of love and sacrifice. And under his pillow, he has a copy of the Bible that she's given him. And there's this moment at the end of the novel where he considers the love that she is living with and what it means for his life, his life that he has lived by the desires of the flesh. And he says this. He said, could her convictions become my convictions? Could I come to the place in life where her convictions become my convictions? And Dostoevsky writes, but that is the beginning of a new story. The story of the gradual renewal of a man The story of his gradual regeneration, of his passing from one world into another, of his initiation into a new, unknown life. And that's the moment of conversion, where we look at the life of Jesus, and we look at people seeking to love in his name. Not that anyone does it perfectly, but that we seek to love in his name. And in our hearts think, What if those convictions could be my convictions? Not just a distant possibility that I put on the mantelpiece at Christmas, but something that I actually live for day to day. Focusing on Jesus and trying to dwell in the presence of Jesus. What if those convictions became my convictions? And if you've never made that decision before, but you make it today, today is the day you become a follower of Jesus. And when you become a follower of Jesus, you are set free. You're set free from the control of the desires of the flesh that rule over us. And you're set free from the law that will do nothing but break you and shame you. You're set free to live by the power of the Spirit. To love other people in Jesus' name. What what if holiness does not exist to make me feel good about myself, nor to make someone else feel bad about themselves, but to set me free to love. You know what I like about Jesus? He made me good and he made me for good. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the vision that you have for our lives, that you don't want us to live broken and selfish lives, chasing after whatever desire hits us today, nor do you want us to live legalistic, self-righteous, condescending lives in which we think we're better than anyone else. Break us free from those two wrong paths. Set us on the right path of living by the Spirit. Pour your Holy Spirit now into anyone who will receive it. Anyone listening in who's willing to say, Jesus, come into my life. Lead my life. Give me the life that you have envisioned for me. Make me holy that I might love in your name. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you again soon. It's been great asking that question every single Sunday, the things we like about Jesus. And something that I love is that he is calling us to do good. When there is so much stuff going around uh, us, he said, hey, you are the peacemakers. You're the ones who are going to be those people. And he's making us better from the inside out. Like he's calling us, transforming us uh, through reading scripture, through community, through prayer. Uh, And so it's really incredible that the creator of the universe wants to be with us. Absolutely. I love that he created us to be good and for good. We are so, so fortunate to be church family with you all. If today's message was one that you want to share with someone because they need the hope and light, or a reminder that they're loved by God. Please just share this on all your socials. And thank you for joining us. But also know that you are being prayed for and cheered for. If today spoke to you and you are ready to make a big faith decision, ready to get plugged into a small group, serving, there are even online serving opportunities, email us, info at reallife.la. Know that we are for you, but God is for you. Have an incredible week. We will see you next time.